Studying biology is difficult, as living organisms are extremely complicated. So, how exactly can we do this? All research may start with questions and hypotheses, but laboratory techniques are required to answer the questions and verify the hypotheses. Here, we will present some molecular biology research techniques that are commonly used to study the cell and its many components. In this video, we will look at six different techniques coming from three domains. First, we will look at ways to visualize the cell and its individual components. Next, we will look at ways to quantify the cell. And finally, we'll look at ways to edit the cell. When you think of visualizing the cell in classic biology terms, the first thing that comes to mind is a microscope. While a microscope is necessary to look inside the basic unit of life, many other steps and techniques must be first employed to give meaning to the images obtained from a microscope. We will next discuss two such techniques to make cellular components glow so that they can be visualized with a fluorescent microscope. In order to visualize specific parts of a cell, we can use green fluorescent protein, commonly referred to as GFP. This protein, naturally found in the jellyfish species Acoria victoria, can make certain cellular components glow. We've discussed the use of GFP in protein localization by creating fusion proteins, but how exactly do fusion proteins work? We can fuse proteins together at the DNA level in a plasmid vector. We can use restriction enzymes to cut the DNA sequence of the plasmid and add in the DNA sequence that codes for GFP. We can ligate the GFP gene with a gene of interest, such as tumor suppressor gene P53, using DNA ligase. Once these two genes are fused together, they will be transcribed together into RNA. Now, we can take our plasmid vector and transfect it into a host cell using a lentivirus. Once the lentivirus infects the host cell with our RNA transcript of interest, it will be reverse transcribed into DNA. The host cell will incorporate this new DNA into its genome where it will be transcribed into RNA, translated into protein, and expressed in the host cell so the gene of interest will glow. We can then see where P53 is located in the cell as it will fluoresce green under a microscope. One of the most commonly used visualization techniques in molecular biology is immunostaining, a technique that relies on the specific antibody-antigen binding that occurs in cells. Antibodies are proteins created by the immune system to target and bind to harmful pathogens that infect our cells. Once bound to the harmful molecule, also known as an antigen, the antibody can either recruit macrophages to destroy the antigen or directly inactivate the antigen through binding. Scientific papers often use a slew of terms to refer to this technique. You may come across words like immunostaining, immunohistochemistry, immunocytochemistry, or immunofluorescence. Immunostaining is the most general of these terms and just refers to the use of antibodies to stain a protein or other molecule, whether in a cell, tissue, or in vitro, meaning outside of a cellular context. Immunohistochemistry is just immunostaining that is employed in a tissue sample, and immunocytochemistry is the same thing employed in cells. Immunofluorescence can be in cells, in tissues, or in vitro, but is more specific as it is a technique that uses fluorescent labels and fluorescence microscopy to visualize the molecules to which an antibody has bound. These words bear slight differences, but remember that they all generally refer to the same thing, the use of antibodies to visualize cellular components. In this video, we will specifically discuss immunocytochemistry with fluorescent labels as this is a very common way that biologists utilize this technique. In a fluorescent immunocytochemistry experiment, there are four components. The target, the primary antibody, the secondary antibody, and the fluorophore. The target of interest is the thing you want to visualize. This may be a specific transcription factor, a tumor marker, or an enzyme. It may be within a cell, or it may be expressed on the surface of the cell. Next is the primary antibody, which will bind directly to the target. Antibodies are proteins composed of two chains, a heavy chain and a light chain, which are connected by disulfide bonds. At one end of the antibody is the FAB region, which stands for antigen binding fragment. This is the region that varies between different antibodies at its, as it specifically binds to one certain antigen. Next is the secondary antibody, which can bind to the primary antibody. The use of a secondary antibody is not necessary in all immunocytochemistry procedures, but it helps to amplify the fluorescence signal, as many secondary antibodies can bind to the primary antibody in many locations. Lastly, there's the fluorophore, which is necessary to actually visualize the target. The fluorophore is a small molecule often covalently linked to the 
secondary antibody through chemical reactions performed beforehand. There are many commercially available fluorophores, but one that's commonly used in immunocytochemistry is FITC, a derivative of fluorescein. This molecule has an isothiocyanate functional group, which can be covalently linked to the free amine or thiol groups in the amino acids of proteins. A secondary antibody may have many free amines and thiols, allowing many FITC molecules to be attached to the secondary antibody, which again allows for amplification of the fluorescent signal. The end result of a fluorescent immunocytochemistry or fusion protein experiment may be measurements of the relative fluorescence in the cell over time, allowing you to assess how the abundance of the target changes over time. Or you may want to assess the location of the fluorescent target to see if it is localized in a certain area of the cell, such as the nucleus or cell membrane. Next up, quantifying the cell. Flow cytometry is a technique we use to count the number of cells or cellular components in a given sample. By breaking down a particular tissue sample, we can look at individual cells, such as liver cells or red blood cells. By lysing cells, we can look at the individual cellular components, such as nuclei or mitochondria. So once we break down and purify our sample, we pass it through the flow cytometer, where the cells flow single file. As they pass through the tube, the cells are excited by lasers. We can detect the presence of a certain kind of cell in the cytometer when it gives off a specific wavelength of light post-excitation. Therefore, flow cytometry measures the concentration of a given component, which is the number of that component present in the sample divided by the total volume of the sample. Although it measures the general parameter of concentration, flow cytometry can tell us information about protein localization based on the amount of protein in an isolated region, cell viability based on the proportion of intact versus degraded DNA, and metabolic capacity based on the number of mitochondria in a cell. The next technique we'll discuss to quantify the cell is mass spectrometry. For molecular biologists, mass spec can be used to confirm the presence of a molecule in a cell as well as determine the structure of that molecule. The technique relies on the ability to use energy to break apart a molecule into several pieces of varying sizes. A charge is imparted on some or all the pieces creating positively charged ions. These ions are then separated and analyzed according to their mass to charge ratio which is denoted as m over z. A mass spectrometer can be broken down into four simple parts. Sample introduction, an ionization source, a mass analyzer, and a detector. In many advanced instruments, some of these parts are combined. Often, the sample introduction and ionization source are combined, or the mass analyzer and detector may com be combined as well. In a simple mass spec experiment, the molecule must first be introduced. If liquid, this can be done by means of injection. If solid, a solid probe can be coated and inserted into the mass spectrometer. Eventually, the sample must end up as a gas, and for this reason, most mass specs operate at very low pressures. Next, the sample must be ionized. A simple method of ionization is electron impact, otherwise known as EI. In EI, a current is passed through a wire which emits electrons that gain a kinetic energies of up to 70 electron volts. The high energy electrons collide with the molecule, effectively removing electrons from the molecule, breaking the bonds, and creating ion fragments. Next, the ions will be analyzed for their mass to charge ratio. This can be done with a time-of-flight analyzer, often abbreviated as TOF. When accelerated through a voltage difference, ions of different masses will gain different velocities. A time-of-flight analyzer measures the distribution of velocities, as smaller ions will gain a greater velocity and will hit a detector more quickly than larger ions. Lastly, the ions are detected. This is commonly done with an electron multiplier, in which the ions hit a metal surface and cause electrons to be ejected. The ejected electrons are attracted to a positive electrode and essentially bounce back and forth between two electrodes. With each bounce, an additional electron is ejected, causing multiplication of electrons. This huge electron flow results in a current that can be detected. <clears throat> At the end of a mass spec run, the mass spectrum will be generated, which has signals corresponding to the mass to charge ratio of the ions. At this point, either a computer or skilled scientist can interpret the mass spectrum to try to determine the structure of the original molecule. To edit an organism's genome at the DNA level, we can use a technique known as Cree locks. The name of the technique comes from the enzyme Cree recombinase and the DNA sequences that are inserted into the genome, known as lock sites. So if we locate the gene of interest, we can insert lock sequences on either side of it. 
These lock sites are the locations at which the Cree recombinase will cut the DNA strand, thus removing the gene of interest or changing its direction. Since genes are expressed in all chromosomes of an organism, Cree locks allows for conditional expression or knockout of a gene, meaning the gene is only removed in certain cells. Lock sites are inserted on either side of gene X in all cells. The Cree recombinase gene is expressed downstream of a specific promoter. This promoter sequence may only be present in certain kinds of tissue, such as liver cells, or may only be present in a certain layer of the brain. By knocking out a gene in a certain location versus the entire organism, we can assess the loss of function that follows localized gene loss rather than observing the death of the organism as a result of total gene knockout. The next technique we'll discuss to edit the genome of a cell or knock out a gene is CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats, was originally discovered in bacteria as an immune response to invading viruses. We'll first discuss how the mechanism occurs in bacteria and then show how scientists have been able to employ it to knock out or edit genes in eukaryotes. When a virus latches onto a bacterial cell, it inserts its DNA into the bacteria with the intention of integrating that DNA into the bacterial genome. Bacteria uses the virus's own DNA to encode a novel spacer into the CRISPR locus in the bacteria's genome. These spacers are transcribed by the bacteria to create CRISPR RNAs, which are complementary to the viral DNA. The CRISPR RNA hybridizes to another DNA molecule in the cell known as the tracer RNA to create the tracer CRISPR RNA complex. The tracer RNA interacts with Cas9, which is the protein that can cleave the double-stranded viral DNA, while the CRISPR RNA hybridizes to the viral DNA. Thus, the tracer CRISPR RNA complex is able to bring both the Cas9 protein and viral DNA into the correct orientation for Cas9 to cleave the DNA. This inactivates it and prevents the virus from integrating its DNA into the bacterial genome. genome. As a gene knockout or gene editing technique, the mechanism is pretty much the same. Researchers locate a gene of interest and design the RNA sequences that will target the gene. Instead of a tracer CRISPR RNA complex, a single guided RNA is designed, which is a single sequence that can bind to both the target gene and Cas9 protein. Upon binding of Cas9 and the target DNA to the RNA, conformational changes in the protein occur, bringing it into the correct orientation to cleave the DNA. Aspartic acid at residue 10 and histidine at residue 840 on the protein are responsible for each breaking one strand of the DNA, with the end result being a double strand of break. To repair this break, the cells utilize two pathways, non-homologous end joining or homology directed repair. Non-homologous end joining or NHEJ is quick and efficient but sloppy and introduces errors into the repaired gene. For gene knockouts, however, this is ideal. The goal is that the random nature of NHEJ will give rise to nucleotide insertions or deletions that will disrupt the reading frame on the DNA and produce a non-functional protein, resulting in a total or partial gene knockout. Homology direct repair, or HDR, is more often used to edit the genome by swapping bases or introducing a short sequence where the break occurred. To introduce a new sequence, a new DNA fragment that contains the insert sequence must be put into the cell. The fragment must contain the insert, pictured in red, flanked by regions that match the regions surrounding the double-stranded break, pictured in green. The sequences in green are then used as templates to fix the break and introduce the new sequence. The final result is a continuous DNA strand that is ready for transcription. These techniques, along with many others not mentioned, expand ways in which we can derive information from or manipulate the basic unit of life, the cell.